Nearly a year ago, I put together a video predicting where Deltarune Chapter 3 was headed. At the same time, I wrote a broad story outline making predictions about the full game as well. This level of theorizing is a unique opportunity granted by the staggered release of Deltarune's chapters. I can't wait to take a crack at it and to write these predictions in stone, so that after Deltarune's full release, people can find their way back here to relentlessly mock my busted theory for many years to come. While we've been shown so much already, it's actually only somewhere between two-fifths and two-sevenths of the full game. There has been mention of there being five chapters, yet the menu in the game clearly has space for seven. Regardless of how that actually gets rolled out for us, I'm making the assumption that we will end up with seven full chapters. That leaves a lot of empty space to fill and plenty of opportunity to completely miss the mark. I don't want to build my predictions up and out based entirely off my Chapter 3 theory video, as that would risk this entire thing toppling over if I got a single key detail wrong before. But in some very generalized ways, I'll be sticking fairly closely to what I shared before on Chapter 3. There were some solid foundations there, and thanks to the Spamton sweepstakes, we do know slightly more about Chapter 3 than anything that comes after. So everything laid out there isn't totally legless, that's why it got its own video. As always, I'll limit my assumptions where I can, but I'm going to have to go notably further out on the limb of some creepy secret tree than when I was simply predicting Chapter 3. My approach in this video is to lay out the different components that we can expect to make up the remaining chapters, then at the end of the video tying those pieces together and trying to make sense of it. There are a lot of things I feel pretty confidently will be included, based simply on the little breadcrumbs and teases and obvious story setups that have taken place. But precisely who's involved, where they take place, in what order, that's all gonna be a bit of a crapshoot. But I still think it'll be fun to try and figure out. For example, it feels safe to assume we will continue to enter new fountains in each chapter, opened through overworld locations, each with their own characters and themes. We'll likely have new NPC companions joining us along the way. And scattered throughout, there are some deeper, lingering questions like that of the night that I expect will be answered along the way. And who knows, if Toby considers Deltarune to be his magnum opus, then we may have far further reaching answers to long-term questions dating back to Undertale, like those related to the mysterious Doctor W.D. Gaster. I encourage you to respond to things directly along the way, include some timestamps, provide your own rebuttals or spins on things, it's gonna be a lot of fun to talk it through in the comments. Before we get too deep into things, I want to share with you guys a trailer for Play Rough an upcoming post-apocalyptic RPG from Nothing Master, the creator of the popular fan game Lisa Rune, a mashup of Lisa and Delta Rune, who is now making his own original standalone RPG that still uses those two games as its main inspiration. You can feel the heart of those other games in here, yet it stands on its own as something totally unique. I think it's wild and weird and delightful, and that's why Two Left Thumbs got involved as a publisher. The entirety of Chapter 1 is available for you to play for free over on Steam right now. Be sure to add that to your wish lists and keep an eye out for the full release coming in 2024. Seriously guys, I think this game is going to be a big deal, and I can't wait for people to start digging into Play Rough as deeply as we've all gone on the Undertale and Deltarune games. I think the easiest way to start would be to attempt to lay out the remaining fountains. We've already been shown two of them in the castle town found through the school's supply closet, and then the cyber world in the library's computer lab. We've also now had the setup of an entirely new world opened in Toriel's living room, presumably a dark world that is fully TV themed. And after last year's Spamton sweepstakes, the setting for Chapter 3 feels all but fully confirmed. 
An argument against that setup or tease did come to mind after releasing the previous prediction video. In the initial Chapter 1 release, our clue for Chapter 2 setting was given by having the annoying dog working away in the computer lab with his maracas. It was largely written off as a gag directly referencing Mira the Sheba found in the UFO ending of Silent Hill 2. And while I don't doubt that was intentional, maybe some players thought to read further into that. Looking back, I'm surprised I didn't, as the annoying dog is a developer stand-in for Undertale and Deltarune creator Toby Fox, clearly spotlighting the next portion of the game he was working on. In the Deltarune Anniversary stream, you know, the one that had very slight random tweaks made to the game, sent me gaslighting the audience to think that Newbert had been there all along. The annoying dog was hanging out up on Sans and Papyrus' balcony. The inclusion of Sans and eventually meeting his brother Papyrus has been teased and then delayed before. It's possible the annoying dog is drawing attention to this specific location yet again. But I think it's pretty safe to assume they were just kind of messing around on that stream unless Newbert shows up as the next big baddie or something. And based on what we were shown at Toriel's at the end of Chapter 2, it's seeming very unlikely Sans and Papyrus' house would be the new fountain location. Or, something much less likely is that everything at Toriel's house at the end of Chapter 2 was again a red herring. After all, Chapter 1 ended with the cliffhanger of Chris pulling out a knife, only for the reveal to be that they wolfed down a pie. That's the only use of the knife that night that we know of. So there's a hair of a chance Chapter 2's ending was a prank gone wrong. Maybe Chris was setting off a stink bomb or something like that? We know Chris has a history of pulling pranks, like showing Noel the ketchup on their arm. And slashing tires and setting off stink bombs, that's pranking 101. I doubt Toby would pull a trick like that twice. This is the magic trick, huh? Illusion, Michael. Mm. Trick is something a whore does for money. I believe instead the annoying dog was placed there to build some excitement for Sans and Papyrus finally playing a bigger role. Maybe we'll finally get to meet Papyrus up in the overworld of Chapter 3. Through the most recent Deltarune devlog, we know that Chapters 3 and 4 will be coming out together as the initial paid release. Originally, the paid release was going to wait on Chapter 5, but we now know that will be coming after. There will be a lot of game to play, but it will remain incomplete. This leaves many open ends that can be wrapped up in a much more dramatic and complicated finale or epilogue of chapters 6 and 7. Plus, that'll give us years of opportunity to craft more insane theories. In a similar vein, I have no idea if those last two chapters will be a DLC, if they will be free, if they'll come out together one at a time. This has been such a wild ride, I'm really excited to see how Toby handles small but significant things like the chapter by chapter release schedule. Looking at the fountains, after the Castle Town, Cyber World, and TV Land, we still have four unknown locations to theorize, assuming each of those four chapters will get their own Dark World. I said I'd limit assumptions, but this video would be like three minutes long if I didn't make a couple leaps in logic. The simplest thing we can do next is look at what locations in town haven't been explored and if they've ever been hinted at as being significant. The relatively untapped locations that come to mind for me are the Town Hall. Ice E's Pizza, the Diner, the Police Station, either Sans's home or shop, the Hospital, the Church and Graveyard, the Back Woods, the Beach or Lake, the upcoming Carnival that we've never seen, Asgore's Flower Shop, and the Secret Southern Bunker Door. I really doubt we'll revisit the school or library. Toby is crazy enough that you can potentially go back to them and they will change throughout the game, but to actually progress the story chapter to chapter, we're probably done with those. I also think we're unlikely to keep going to random NPCs' homes. Those compared to each other would be redundant, but now especially after Toriel's house. I think it's very likely that Undyne will appear in Chapter 3, so the police station is likely cut. 
neither Ice Ease or the diner have been made to feel significant. They fill out the town, include small details about various characters, and are vehicles for a handful of gags. And while I think it's significant that the only time we see Icy in Undertale is through Sans, that's the subject of a previous video, thematically, Icy's and the diner are two of the least interesting locations. A room full of board games, or the entire internet, those are big ideas. A regular diner is not. I believe Sans will be made significant to the larger story without needing to literally venture into a dark world of his home or shop. I hope we get to pick further at the threads of this character, but think the fountains will be opened elsewhere. Maybe we'll even come to learn Sans is aware of the fountains and is separately working on his own solution. Then needing to collaborate with him up in his lab, something like that could be really cool. That now leaves us with the town hall, hospital, church, woods, beach, carnival, flower shop, and bunker door. These are ones I can't immediately write off and need to inspect more closely. I'm going to lump together the church, graveyard, and woods for thematic reasons, I'll explain why momentarily. But that leaves us with seven possible candidate locations for a fountain in only four remaining chapters. I'll lay out the least likely ones first, and we'll build additional arguments from there. The Town Hall we have not seen a lot of this location, and it would be a great opportunity to finally pay off some reveals. Like, who the heck is Noelle's mom? Is it a character we've met before in Undertale? Will she be significant to the story? What does C stand for? Will we learn more about Des or Rudy through her and her relationship with Noelle? But I personally believe those are mysteries that could be left for the hometown specifically. If the only intrigue in the game were in the dark worlds, we'd lose the desire to connect with the town and its inhabitants in between. How the real world characters interact and how their stories progress fleshes things out and makes the happenings of the dark world more meaningful. Becoming invested in these worlds and characters is something Toby has always excelled at. So meeting Noelle's mom, maybe seeing her house, eventually meeting someone like Papyrus. These are all things I think will not be explored through fountains, which segues nicely into another item on the list. The Bunker Door. I don't think any fountains will be here, at least not how we've currently seen them, if at all. I suspect this bunker is a bit of a misdirect, and it will instead be something that gets explored in the Lightner world at the very end of the game. Perhaps it will have the narrative fidelity to combine plot elements of both the light and dark worlds. Maybe we finally learn more about Gaster? Or some key question about how Deltarune and Undertale interact or coexist? It's almost too obvious, and so I'd prefer it sort of remain its own separate mystery and not some inevitable endpoint. One thing that points in favor of this location is that it's a giant pair of double doors, something that's been important to our previous two chapter fountains. The door sprite to the computer lab was even redone for chapter two to keep that consistent, but that could have been done for other reasons and we may see that trend broken already with chapter three seemingly being at Toriel's place. The bunker door's inclusion will really depend on what the larger, true story is here. There's, however, too many unknowns, so I'm taking it off the fountain list. The Hospital. This was the most difficult cut to make, but there was absolutely going to be a fountain either here or the church. I'll make my arguments in favor of the church immediately after. The main appeal of the hospital is that this is where we get to spend time with Noel's father, Rudy. Having a fountain here would allow this father-daughter gamer duo to have an epic adventure together before he passes away. I'm sorry, but I don't think Rudy is going to make it. The game needs a dedicated location to learn more about Noelle, especially expanding on her family. We barely know anything about Rudy, we know a tiny bit about Des, although she's gone missing and we have yet to meet her mother. Noelle is clearly a major player in this series, and I think Chapter 2's weird route was only a hint of what's to come. 
but having Rudy here is effectively the only important thing we have in the hospital. And in Chapter 2, we've already seen concepts like the viruses, ambulances, and Ralse being dressed as a nurse when battling Vero Vero Coons. I doubt Toby would want to rehash any of those designs or themes. Which means the much more fitting location for this part of the story would instead be the church. Now we're into a part of the list here where I'm identifying locations I think will be featured in upcoming chapters. I think the church has already been underscored many more times than the hospital as being important. And it could cover very much the same plot beats as the hospital. And we know from an unused bit of content, the Sky Mantle, that items will be able to give holy buffs, which is much more in line with the church. Rudy mentions that he plans to go to church tomorrow. The different chapters of this game like to talk about tomorrow a lot. Which, as an aside, Alfie's mentioned not having school tomorrow, which would lead us to believe that Chapter 3 is taking place on a Saturday? This has caused some confusion. Maybe Rudy is going to a Saturday vigil. Maybe for some reason he can't leave the hospital on Sunday. I don't know. I'm sure the days of the week are important, but I'm not focusing on that now. Through a conversation tree with Alvin, we also have more direct mentions of the church. And you know what? It has a big old set of double doors. And I tend to pay attention to what Alvin's saying, because Gerson was one of the only characters in Undertale to ever talk about the Delta Room. Rudy and Noel are playing the fantasy adventure title Dragon Blazers 3 together. And we know that Gerson was a fantasy author. So if Alvin, Rudy, and Noel ended up in a world together, I would expect elements of those fantasy novels to make their way in. Potentially to the point that that becomes the focus of this dark world rather than the religious themes. I actually originally doubted the church at all, because there was seemingly no way to do it without this game becoming much more political than Toby has ever done before. Even if not tackling religious themes head on, he'd be inviting a lot of unfavorable takes from a new audience. But I think he could skirt any of that if he chooses. The fantasy tropes would be one way to do so. Back on topic, with the redundancy of the church and the hospital, I think in this exploration, things could be taken notably further further and darker through the church than they could at the hospital. In Chapter 2, we learned of Noel, Des, Chris, and Asriel hanging out in the woods behind the graveyard together. And the graveyard is directly a part of the church, meaning that the forest is likely the section of the map that we've been blocked off from. I thought there was pretty high odds that a fountain would be opened in those woods, but I think the church, graveyard, and forest may get treated as one? Maybe that's too big of a stretch. I'm iffy on that. For now, I'm lumping them all together. How cool would it be to visit a spooky forest area that's a little bit graveyard, a little bit old woods? Maybe everything would be horror influenced, like Toby's old Halloween hack of Earthbound. We'd have holy angels and cherubs battling against ghouls and such. I'm kind of avoiding specifically pointing out skeletons, even though they're incredibly likely to be connected to a graveyard. We know Noelle's sister Des went missing. Did she go missing in this forest? Is that why it's roped off? If so, then a chapter focused on Noelle and Rudy, set in the location Des went missing, would be so perfect. There is so much to unpack there. There's also a theory from some more optimistic players out there that will find the source of Rudy's illness in a dark world and cure him, similar to how Birdly hurt his arm and it carried forward to the overworld. So if that's true, maybe the inverse of healing someone could be as well. That's often taken a step further by some suggesting that the end of Susie's arc will be that she instead becomes a healer character rather than a brawling fighter. I think that would be cool. Then having Rudy re-enter the hometown with a miracle recovery. I think if anything, we would learn more about Des, potentially even finding where she went, but I don't think Rudy's making it out of there. If Des does make an appearance here, Rudy is going to sacrifice himself to save her. Considering how unsettling and horrific the weird route was, giving Noelle the ability to kill these darkners, pushing her against her will to this hyper-violence. There is absolutely going to be a moment in this game where some major decision along the lines of saving Des or saving Rudy is going to come down to how we behaved on that route. Obtaining that great power to save either her sister or father, but at great and deep 
personal cost. I could be way off the mark, but I think that would be a sufficiently heavy and devastating endpoint for an incredibly haunting beginning. Whether it's the church, graveyard, forest, or a combination of them, this seems like a very obvious location for a fountain. A water world. I have notably less theorizing to tie to this one, but I feel a water-based world seems fairly likely, with Onion playing an intriguing recurring role, with a lot of focus being put on this rather remote location. We've been led back here before with teases of tomorrow, and I could easily see that happening again. Plus, a water world would just be a cool, unique switch up from what we've seen before. I'm trying to avoid retreading old themes, and while there is lots of water-based things in Undertale's waterfall, a water-based dark fountain would be totally different from what we've seen in Deltarune. Is Toby brazen enough to include a water level when traditionally those are always people's least favorite levels? Sure, this ain't no platformer, I don't think it'd be a concern at all. Some of the hints that have been pointing us towards this beach include Onion Son informing us of music coming from down below, and then the next day we see Shiren laid up at the hospital. We know from the official Undertale blog that Sans has a specific interest in Shiren, as well as appearing during her possible concert when battling in Undertale. Shiren is a little mysterious, but not in a way that feels it needs a super deep exploration. An NPC I would like to see a deeper follow-up on is the Clam Girl, a character updated in Undertale to have a chance of appearing as a goner and who makes reference to Susie, albeit with a different spelling. And you know, the clam girl is another water-based monster. Honestly, I feel like I'm talking myself out of this one in real time here. None of that evidence is all that compelling. This is kind of at the bottom of my overall ranking of actual possibilities. And most importantly, don't forget to bring a towel as Gore's Flower King Flower Shop. This one I feel much more confident in, to the point I think it's all but a guarantee. It would really bring things full circle if Asriel were to return to town, as hinted by Toriel, with us then being given an opportunity to spend time with him and Asgore together. And, as many have pointed out before, the shop even has a pair of double doors at the back that we've never gotten to explore. We are very likely to bring Toriel into a dark world in Chapter 3, so it's only fair that Asgore gets a similar opportunity later on. In Deltarune, Asgore is both divorced and was the previous police chief. The theory surrounding his removal from that position that I most like is that Des Holiday went missing when Asgore was in charge. I doubt that directly led to the end of his marriage, but depending how he handled the situation and how deeply he spiraled, it could have indirectly brought an end to things. Nobody really knows if Des is simply missing or has passed away. Whenever it's brought up, everyone gets very quiet and tries not to talk about Des, rather than directly mourning her or trying to console one another. So either her death was horrific or remains unconfirmed. It is possible that Des was pulled into a dark world all that time ago, and we could actually rescue her and bring her back. I imagine the prior church chapter will focus on Noel and Rudy's grief, while Asgore's flower shop chapter will be more about the case itself, unpacking some unanswered questions of her disappearance. And if Asriel is back in town, then we can hear more from one of Des's closest friends, perhaps someone who had spent time with her shortly before before that event. There's so much opportunity there to further explore the story and add to these characters. We can start pulling at threads like how or if Asriel and Ralsei are connected. What was the nature of Asriel and Dessus' relationship? How are things between Asgore and Asriel, along with further connections within the Dreamer and Holiday families as well as across the two? And in a flower-based dark world, I'm certain some link between Asriel and Flowey will be made. Likely not so literal, as Alfie's isn't doing her experiments in Deltarune, but there's not a chance that Toby would set something in a garden-themed world with Asriel present and not lean on that in some way. 
There are plenty of themes to explore, such as Asgore failing as a parent and as an authority figure, drawing parallels directly to Undertale. I expect this would be one of the most harrowing and brutal chapters of the game, peeling back a lot of the trauma this town and its inhabitants have shared. It all just lines up too well. And the final location I'm treating as a legitimate possibility, the Carnival. At the end of Chapter 2, we had direct discussions about the coming carnival, one that we know will occupy the entire town. So the logical answer there would be for the Roaring to coincide with this. The direct consequence of too many fountains being opened, engulfing the entire town, blending the wacky carnival setting into that. This would have the potential to fold in basically every character and bring things to a thematic close. Alternately, the Roaring could end up being something like Chapter 5, leaving us on a major cliffhanger to sit on for who knows how long. That could explain why Toby had once planned to release Chapter 3 through 5 together making sure that that build-up to something major and climactic is available for players to play all at once. The new plan is to release 3 and 4 together and 5 separately after. So knowing that he's now willing to separate out Chapter 5, there's a decent chance it could be used to set up the Roaring, then having Chapter 6 deal with that, and having 7 be more of an epilogue. There are really too many different ways to arrange those events to really know for sure, but I think having an overlap of this festival and the Roaring is very likely, regardless of where it takes place in the larger story. I think a really interesting choice would be if the world effectively becomes Undertale in this scenario. The entire town is brought into darkness. All the monsters are pulled in together hidden away from the overworld and that much-desired sunlight. They would all have alternate designs and magic abilities in this fountain that they currently lack in the hometown. I'm not fully confident in that, but it could bridge the two games in a really unexpected way, making Deltarune like Undertale without literally being Undertale. It's worth noting that our two optional secret boss battles so far have been carnival-themed. We have Jevil in a merry-go-round and Spampton on a roller coaster. We're gathering up these shadow crystals for some unknown purpose, and whatever that ends up being, this location would be the most logical place for that to pay off. I imagine dramatically altering the setting whether or not you had defeated those bosses in your playthrough. One knock against the possibility of this setting is that we've already had some pretty major carnival-like inclusions in Chapter 2. I doubt Toby will want to have things like carnival games and ferris wheels in a fountain a second time. It just seems a little repetitious. Then again, after that dream sequence, coming back around to give Noelle and Susie the opportunity to ride a ferris wheel together, whether that's above ground or in a dark world, would just be very sweet. So in that regard, including the carnival once before could be seen as more of a setup or tease, with Susie effectively practicing what their first date could be. Alternately, the carnival could be overworld only, I'm totally out to lunch, and the only purpose of the carnival will be to allow you to explore the otherwise relatively static overworld and its various NPCs in an entirely new context. It would be a great way to ensure you're not just revisiting the exact same locations six or seven times in a row. Now that I've established what I think the most likely fountain locations will be, I think the next key element of how these chapters will play out is to consider which NPCs will be joining us in each fountain. It's entirely possible Toby does a major sequence break, diverting away from fountains or in bringing party members down there with us. Again, I'm very much operating on the assumption that there is a pattern here. I say party members as I'm leaning into RPG tropes and using it as a quick and easy way to mark these companion characters. I would include Noelle and Birdly in this, even though we never actually had Birdly in our party. So really what I'm getting at is any hometown monsters who I think will eventually get pulled into a fountain. Susie is the OG, I expect she'll be with us the whole time whether or not she has little side adventures of her own like she did in Chapter 2. Noelle and Birdly joined for Chapter 2, and as I've established, I think Chapter 3 will certainly include Toriel and very likely Undyne. 
So now let's look beyond those. Remember the interesting names seen through the vessel creation section at the beginning of the game? These are names that have special dialogue when entered, either as an interesting coincidence when set for the vessel and how interesting when set for the creator. These include QC, Sans, Undyne, Toriel, Asriel, Asgore, Papyrus, Jockington, Gerson, Braddy, Alfie's, Birdly, Caddy, Caddy, and Rudy. Note that Chris, Susie, and Noel are not included. Neither is Ralsei, but Ralsei is a darkener, so I wouldn't expect them to be. And those other three, I assume not, because they're already main characters. And now I'm going to throw out names we've already seen, plus Toriel and Undyne, which leaves us with just 12 names to be split across the next five chapters. Two I immediately call into question would be Gerson, who has already passed away, and QC, the unseen owner of the diner. Maybe we'll have a fountain in the diner after all? Or maybe I'm reading entirely the wrong thing into these names. But I'm interpreting this as being a list of semi-important NPCs, ones who will have direct roles or influences on the story. I think Sans and Papyrus are incredibly likely. Toby knows people want to see more of these characters, and I imagine on some level he wants to write more for them again as well. There's no way it isn't insanely fun to write this goofy duo. I still doubt we'll have an actual fountain at their place, but I have some other theories. Chris's classmates Jockington and Caddy are great friends, and will likely be pulled in together. They'll probably have a side adventure of their own, similar to the way Birdly was never really a part of our troop. Having additional characters that know Chris, Susie, and Noelle well will allow for that trio to be played off of in fun and interesting ways. We know Asriel and Caddy are good friends. Maybe they'll be hanging out in the diner of the overworld in one chapter. But I don't think anyone is dying to see these two together in a fountain. That's not a well-established relationship that I expect to see laid out in any great detail. Not when the likes of Asriel and Asgore could be paired off instead. Caddy and Braddy, however, are a much more important pairing. Even though they seemingly dislike each other in Deltarune, a small subplot of them just kind of being there and slowly becoming friends could be fun to witness. Rudy will appear in a chapter with Noel. I'm very much assuming Noel will continue to appear in multiple additional chapters. She's far too important of a character for that to have been a one-off the way Birdly might be. But if or when Rudy passes away, she may become a little more reclusive and sit on the sidelines for a few chapters. As I've suggested before, I think the church is more likely than the hospital. And if that's true, alongside Rudy and Noel, we may get to see Gerson. No, not some weird turtle zombie from the graveyard. I think Toby would sidestep the religious allegory by instead making the church into more of a fantasy setting. Similar to the Dragon Blazers game, the holidays play together. The church likely features a library of some sorts, or potentially just a collection of Alvin's copies of Gerson's old novels, then being accessed within the Dark Fountain and projecting a version of Gerson's old hammer-swinging legendary hero persona into the mix. Maybe I'm stretching things too far to make this random list of names make sense, but with Gerson's associations with both the church, a fantasy setting, his extensive knowledge of the Deltarune, and generally being a wizened old character who likely knows a thing or two about loss, bringing him back in this way could be incredibly interesting. I actually have the most trouble determining where Alphys would appear, as I think the most likely is actually going to be Chapter 3. It could be that she's worried about Chris and comes to speak to Toriel, a fellow teacher and a friend, ashamed that she didn't speak up when the two crossed paths at school earlier. I think this is made all the more likely because it will give Alphys and Undyne a chance to explore their relationship in the fountain. It wouldn't be the first Dark World love connection we've seen blossom, and I've seen theories that Napstabluke will either come with Undyne to answer Toriel's call, with a few even suggesting instead of Undyne, but I'm not convinced of that, which would allow for that Alphys Metaton connection to form as well. And, and, and if it's a TV 
world, that means we'll likely get to see Alfie's meeting Mew Mew in some way, and otherwise playing around with silly anime tropes, and that all just sounds too perfect. Especially in an earlier part of the game, before things slowly shift to becoming much more dark and serious. Before moving into the end part of this video, I do quickly want to shout out Fruz yet again for helping with the editing of this video. It genuinely likely would have never come out without their help. Fruz, please be sure to include a few cool clips from your own channel here. Let the people know some of what you've got going on, and I'll make sure there's a link to your channel down below. Now it's time for my final chapter, ordering and predictions. Attempting to tie things together as best I can, throwing out things that don't really contribute to the larger picture I have in my mind and stringing together a few more loose connections to attempt to make something cohesive. This entire video feels like such a big swing already that I might as well try to stake out something more specific. There are infinite ways the wheels could come off this rickety bike between chapter 2 through to the finale. We could abandon the cycle of entering a new fountain and then hanging out in the overworld. The roaring could be triggered sooner than expected. Characters could arrive at different times. Maybe Rudy survives, maybe Des never comes back. The emphasis could instead shift to the many mysteries, such as who is controlling Chris? What happened to Des? What are the consequences of the weird route? Or what's going on with the southern bunker? It's impossible to actually get everything correct here, and I wouldn't be surprised if I end up being aggressively wrong. But hopefully you've all enjoyed the process of laying out how I came to my own final summary, and I look forward to hearing some of your own pitches down below. So let's start laying things out, shall we? We know chapter 2 was still a school day, and Alfie's confirms there is no school tomorrow. Rudy is planning to go to church that day, which would be the equivalent of the fairly standard Saturday vigil, or he's potentially just going for some private prayers. That's pretty unclear. This would place chapter 4 as Sunday when most church services are, although there could be the fountain on Saturday, and the church is simply open to be explored on Sunday, not actually holding a mass, a lot of these in-world schedules are only half known. And with Toriel confirming Asriel is coming next week, I'm assuming we're treating Monday as the start of a week, not Sunday. I believe it's also hinted at that the big festival is coming next week, so that would also be somewhere after Monday. So where do these final pieces leave us? Chapter 3, Saturday, in a TV world, with Undyne, Toriel, and Alfie's. I did an entire video on that one, although at the time I didn't really consider the idea of Alfie's or Napstablook being introduced, but I don't really have much more to add to that one. Chapter 4, Sunday in the Church, with Noel, Rudy, and maybe Gerson? This will be a deeply emotional chapter. Noel and Rudy will share a final adventure, opening many doors on the death storyline, allowing Noel the opportunity to grieve her sister, while also saying farewell to Rudy. Chapter 2 established that Noelle is rather emotionally vulnerable at this point, and is greatly at risk of outside influences. There are many ways they could go with this, but the loss of her father could push her towards outright villain. I'm not going to elaborate on that further, because I haven't given it a lot of thought, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I am worried about Noelle. Chapter 5, Monday at the Flower Shop, with Asgore and Asriel. The carnival is starting to be set up in the overworld, and Asriel is back in town. This will be a pivotal chapter, bringing in this father and son together, both with direct ties to Des, carrying on with the storyline seen in Chapter 3, and answering a bunch of associated questions. I think Toby wanted to release 3 through 5 so that there's a semblance of a conclusion to some of these subplots, as well as Chapter 5 setting up the big climax. With only 3 and 4 releasing together, there will at least be a mini arc for Noel and Rudy, which can then be carried forward in Chapter 5, building that up further with Asriel and Asgore. Chapter 6, Tuesday, The Carnival, bringing in basically everyone else, Sans, Papyrus, Jockington, Caddy, Caddy, and Braddy. At the start of the day, the carnival will be fully set up, and the roaring will begin. The entire town would be engulfed in a fountain, bringing in every previous character as well as those who haven't been included in a chapter yet. 
I imagine we'll finally know who the knight is, and some of the larger questions of the series can start to be addressed. Sans and Papyrus will play their most prominent role here, and could offer up many answers to questions we weren't even thinking to ask, as well as just adding a bit of levity to what is otherwise going to be a horrible situation. And maybe here is where we'll finally learn what Ralsei's whole deal is. Then Chapter 7, on a Wednesday, serving as an epilogue. When I was first scripting out this video, I actually had a water fountain. No, not the drinking kind. But as I was pulling things together, trying to craft a story that spans seven chapters, it felt like it kept getting in the way of the actual story. I don't think there's any characters that would have anything to deal with down there, or important enough questions that an entire chapter would need to be dedicated to it. So I ended up throwing that one out, and I think lingering questions, including ones tied to the lake north of town, will be addressed during a post-fountain overworld section and the finale of the game will finally bring us to the bunker. Perhaps one last fountain will be opened here, but instead we could simply venture directly down through those doors. If Toby ever plans to address larger questions about the series, not just Deltarune, like, what did this game's opening sequence mean? How do Deltarune and Undertale connect? What exactly became of Gaster? What are the goners? And a hundred other small little details that could be expanded upon. If he's ever going to do it, I expect it would be at the end of Deltarune. And what better place to do it than one of the biggest sources of intrigue that he stitched into this game right from the beginning. He could just as easily leave it all a mystery, but by the time Deltarune is fully released, Toby will have been making this pair of games for something like 15 years, and I imagine he'll want to give it a nice, proper, conclusive feeling. I'm beyond thrilled to learn that Chapter 3 is effectively done, and we now only have to wait on the production of the fourth. I think it's incredibly likely that that pair of chapters release in 2024, so we won't have to wait too long to start getting answers to some of these, and I think it'll be very fun to come back to this pair of videos and see if I was remotely close to anything, really. In the process of putting this video together, I expanded much more deeply on a handful of things, how precisely I saw certain plot points tying together, some light theorizing on the night, and other random extras. Current it's not enough to exist as its own video, and I thought it would be kind of half-baked if I tried to stitch it into this one. So right now I have a couple pages of notes on more general Deltarune predictions that are sitting off to the side. I imagine once this video drops and people start firing off their comments, it could get some of those wheels turning again, and maybe help me expand on a few of those ideas. If or when I feel like that properly comes together, then I could make a third video in this little series of predictions that just knocks out a few of these ideas I currently have rattling around up in the old noggin. If you're as hungry as I've been for some new RPG fantasy mysteries and insanity, then please be sure to go check out Play Rough. You can play that first chapter now for free, mess around with the different ways you can affect the story of that game right out of the gate, add that one to your wish lists, and look forward to the full release planned for 2024. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.